Hi, I'm Andrea. Welcome to today's Harper Lecture. The Harper Lecture series highlights the University of Chicago's collective commitment to the highest aspirations and standards in research and education. Today, you will hear from our world-class faculty and enjoy stimulating conversations on critical topics, all in the comfort of your home. We extend our appreciation in advance to our global university community for their collective efforts in supporting the mission of the university in today's deeply challenging environment. Technology has allowed us to remain connected and engaged, and tonight, you too will be part of the conversations. A couple of notes. All participants will be muted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions. We will have plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. If you have issues with audio, you may want to shut down your programs running in the background or dial in from your phone. Hi, I'm Colin. On behalf of everyone at the UChicago Alumni Office, we offer our deepest gratitude and appreciation for your continued support. We're proud to be part of this community as it has come together during these trying times to invest in our students, empower our faculty and scientists, and extend care and connection. And now it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 41st season of the University of Chicago's Harper Lecture Series. Thank you for being with us. Enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to today's Harper Lecture, Race, Violence and Medicine, Showing Up for Justice with Dr. Brian Williams. I'm Andrea Hodgman, Associate Director for Intellectual Engagement and Travel and the Program Manager for the Harper Lecture Series. On behalf of everyone at the UChicago Alumni Office, thank you for joining us. Please allow me to introduce our moderator. Dr. Stephen Estime is an Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at the University of Chicago. He completed his anesthesiology residency at the University of Chicago, followed by a critical care fellowship at Brigham and w Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He currently practices as an anesthesiologist in the operating room and as a critical care physician in the trauma surgical intensive care unit. His interests and in academic work focus on quality improvement, patient safety, and health equity and he serves as a Director for Diversity and Inclusion in the Graduate Medical Education Office. Dr. Williams and Estime, thank you for joining us. Dr. Estime, I'll hand things over to you. Andrea, thank you for that uh, introduction. And thank you everybody for um, having me here to, uh, to moderate this really important discussion and should be a very, very engaging discussion um, by Dr. Brian Williams. Um, so it's my pleasure, my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Williams. Um, he is an associate professor of trauma and acute care surgery here at the University of Chicago. He graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy with an aeronautical engineering degree. And after six years of active duty, he went on to obtain his medical degree from the University of South Florida's College of, uh, College of Medicine. He completed a general surgery residency at Harvard University's Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, then completed a trauma and surgical critical care fellowship at Emory and Great Memorial Hospital uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. His medical expertise allows him to perform life-saving surgeries in the most dire situation in some of society's most vulnerable patients. This work has shed light on larger upstream issues that our, nations, that our nation uh, faces. Dr. Williams has become a powerful force as it relates to advocacy against racial injustice gun violence, healthcare disparities, and social inequities. Dr. Williams served as chairman of Dallas Police Citizens Review Board. He hosts his own podcast, Race, Violence, and Medicine. He is a regular contributor to the Chicago Tribune, Dallas Morning News, and CNN. He's also a passionate educator, leader, mentor to students, residents, fellows, and many attending physicians alike, including myself. He's an author, father, husband, friend, and an overall great person. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Brian Williams. Dr. Osame, thank you for the invitation. And I want to thank all of you for the privilege of speaking this evening. Now, as we move into 2021, I've given a lot of thought to what 2020 meant to me. 
And there is a lot to unpack about that year, personally, professionally. And uh, there's a couple of moments during the year that really stand out to me as seminal moments. And one of those occurs just before Thanksgiving. And if you recall that time, we were as a country moving into the second wave of the COVID pandemic. We were getting recommendations not to travel for the holidays, to avoid large family gatherings, which you know, it's kind of challenging for those of us that had been uh, separated from our families for, for months on end. And one morning I was actually getting prepared to give a talk and my phone rang. And I looked at the caller ID and it was, it was from home. My parents live in Virginia. And I, I don't know if you got, about you, but I've had that pit in my stomach that I was about to get bad news because this is not the time of the day for my parents to ever call me, nor during the week at that time. So it was out of character. And I just had this sense that this was not going to be a phone call I wanted to take. Uh, I answered the phone, it was, it was my mother. And she said, Brian, your father, he wants to go home, which to my parents, their home was Florida. So they wanted to drive from Virginia to Florida. And I said, mom, you cannot travel right now. COVID is out of control. You're both elderly. My mom says she's not elderly, she's sub-elderly, but I made my argument that you have comorbidities, it's not the time to travel, please just stay home. My father was having none of that, which I uh, not surprising to me, uh, especially when it has to do with family. And then my mom gave me the punchline. She said, we're going, your dad wants to go, it's your cousin. She's been shot and she's been killed. So at that moment, everything sort of shifted for me. Uh, I stopped being the son advising my parents and shifted into this mode of being a trauma surgeon, which is sometimes difficult for me to turn off because I've been dealing with violence for so long. So when I hear about gun violence and it's my cousin who's female, Immediately, my mind starts running through these, these stats that I know, but that are actually useless to my parents at this time, knowing that since this was a female, that this was probably an incident of intimate partner violence, because I know that women are five times more likely to be killed by a male partner when a gun is involved, or that Black women are three times more likely than white women to be killed by intimate partners with a gun. And something that lives my day to day is that 50% of all firearm homicides are uh, African Americans. So I, I see this, the world through this lens of violence and race, which is, you know, I'm not complaining. It's just that I've chosen this, this uh, profession and I want to do it well. And when these things like this happen, my mind just goes off in these different directions. But I began to think about these things a lot differently since I've arrived to Chicago, particularly when it comes to gun violence and what that means in the larger context of health, achieving health care justice. Now, this is not a talk about gun control. This is not a talk about the Second Amendment. This is just using gun violence to illustrate some larger issues. But understand, although I talk about gun violence in, in its terms of urban violence and racial disparities, gun violence is actually a global phenomenon. And in the United States, when we talk about gun violence, we are actually an outlier when it comes to high wealth countries. So if I mentioned that Black men comprise 50% of all firearms deaths annually, understand that when it comes to firearm deaths all comers, white men are four times more likely to die in this country than other high wealth countries. So gun violence does impact all of us across racial and ethnic uh, distinctions. But again, we are gonna talk about some larger issues illustrated by my, my dealings with gun violence. Which takes us back to that first uh, graphic I had up, which is here on the screen with the red dots. This comes out in the Chicago Tribune every week. And it's something I, I go to to kind of keep track of the firearm homicides. And it tells me things that I know because I'm, I'm deep in this all the time. And you may know intuitively, but 
most of the homicides within Chicago impact young black men in two distinct geographic regions of the city, the west side and the, the south side. But also, I'm a trauma surgeon, but part of being a trauma surgeon is being an intensive care specialist as well. So I work in the ICU and people that have severe COVID illness spend time in the ICU. So I was also keeping track of those numbers as they impacted Chicago throughout 2020. And one day I saw this map that showed the COVID deaths in Chicago and the purple dots represented black Chicagoans who were dying from the disease. And I immediately got just chilled without my spine. So I looked at this map, it resembled the map I saw for gun violence. Same regions, same racial disparities and black Chicagoans were dying at far more the rate than their population of the city. So if you look at these maps individually, they may tell a story, one about gun violence, one about COVID, but together there's much bigger story behind all this. Which brings us now to 2021, where the vaccine is now out, right? We're kind of turning the corner on the pandemic. We have this vaccine and I was watching how the vaccine distribution was occurring throughout the city. And I came across this map, uh, actually from one of my partners or one of my colleagues in pulmonary critical care here at the university, put this together. And it shows that Look at the blue map, the dark areas are where there is the highest uptake of vaccinations and the light blue areas were the lowest uptakes. And the low uptake of vaccines also overlap the areas where we had the highest levels of gun violence and the highest level of infections and deaths from COVID. From COVID. So those that were getting protected with the vaccine, it was the inverse of those who were being infected and dying from the vaccine. So that's a third story. We have one about gun violence, one about a respiratory pandemic, and one about vaccine equity. But I will readily admit that I did not give much thought to these larger issues for a long time. I felt I'm a doctor, I'm a uh, trauma surgeon, I'm an educator. So my job is to be the best surgeon I can be and be the best educator I can be and just focus on that. And these larger issues, uh, they were beyond my purview. But I recognize that that is not the case. There is more that can be done. And for me, it kind of, it took a tragedy to wake me up to the reality that there was a larger role I could play individually. And I think there's a larger role that all of us can play when it comes to achieving healthcare justice. And that occurred on July 7th, 2016 in Dallas. So prior to my coming to the University, University of Chicago, I was on faculty at, uh, in Dallas, Texas, and I was there for nine years working at Parkland Hospital, another busy uh, urban community hospital that deals with a lot of gun violence. And if you recall 2016, this was the summer of the election between Clinton and Trump. This was also a year that we had these high profile mass shootings. Just a few weeks before this, there was the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida. And also the day before this, on July 6th, was when Philando Castile was shot and killed outside of Minneapolis. His girlfriend streamed his death on Facebook Live, he was pulled over for a routine traffic stop. And with, within seconds, uh, he was shot multiple times, two of which pierced his heart. The day before that, on July 5th, was Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who was restrained on the ground and shot and killed at point blank range. So we had 48, 72 hours of violence and high profile deaths that involved black men and police officers. So on July 7th, there were peaceful protests scheduled to occur all across the country. But the one that people may remember, if you remember any of them at all, is the one that happened in Dallas, because that is the one that turned deadly. 
Now, as I said, as a trauma surgeon at, at these busy level one centers, there's always a team in house. A trauma surgeon, nurses, an academic center, you may have residents, uh, students, but there's a team 24 seven to be prepared for any sort of injured patient that may need life saving care. So when I went into work this night, I had no expectation of what was about to happen. I knew there were protests. I knew there was one in Dallas. I was aware of the violence the past couple of days, and I was aware of the public narrative that was occurring that was Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. But as I walked into work that night, this was furthest from my mind. At the protest in Dallas downtown, which by all accounts began peacefully, there was collegiality between law enforcement who was there providing security as well as the protesters. There was a shooter, African-American male, a military veteran who was there with the intent of seeking retribution by shooting white police officers. He shot 14 officers and 17, or excuse me, seven of those officers were brought to the hospital where I was working that night with, with the team. And this occurred pretty quickly. Ordinarily, we get some notification in advance of injured patients coming in. But on this night, with no notification, they just showed up because downtown, the shooter was targeting officers so quickly that as they were injured, their partners would pick them up, put them in the back of squad cars, and just take off and come to the hospital. So pretty rapidly, we had to flex into our mass casualty response. Of those seven officers that arrived, three uh, died from their wounds. And I still think about this night to this day. It is the worst night of my career and one that I, I will never forget. And although I've tried to run from it in many ways, I've now come to the point where I realize I have to integrate this tragedy into my life and try to bring some good out of it. But back then, I did what I do best, which was avoid it, compartmentalize it, try to pretend it didn't happen. And for the days after the shooting, I did not watch the news. I did not read the newspaper, no radio. Uh, this was a dominant story. It was a constant trigger for me. And I had this loop in my head about what happened. And I did not want any sort of uh, reminder of what had happened that evening. But then came Monday, four days after the shooting, and one of my partners contacted me and said, hey, we're going to have a press conference today to talk about the shooting. And I'm sure we've, we're kind of used to these, these press conferences that occur after these mass shootings. And I immediately said, I'm not going to this conf press conference. I don't want to be there. This is the worst night of my life. I shouldn't have been that worst out of my life, worst out of my career. And at the time, it was constantly just running through my mind about the fact that these three officers had died. That night, after I talked to one of the police officers' families about uh, the death of their, their son, uh, it's a conversation I always want to get right because none of us wake up expecting that we or someone we love will die from an unplanned traumatic death. So when I have this conversation with the family, I want to get it right because I do not want to add trauma on top of trauma. But that night, I was also aware of what was going on with the black shooter targeting white police officers. And me going in, I was the only black trauma surgeon in the group going to have this discussion with a family of law enforcement. So there was a lot of hot button issues wrapped up into this one event, but that did not inform how I approached this because we in healthcare, we have to recognize the commonality of the human experience of everyone we deal with. And I just wanted to tell, do this with sensitivity and avoid adding additional trauma. But when I left the room, uh, this is well past the critical parts of the, uh, the evening. We already had three dead police officers. The other four were being treated for non-lethal injuries. And the team was kind of on autopilot, cleaning wounds, getting labs, checking x-rays. 
I walked out of the room and instead of going back into the trauma center, I took a left turn and went down this hallway, back hallway. The doors closed behind me and it was dead silent. I was by myself. And at that moment, I just broke. I leaned up against the wall, slid down to the floor and had my head in my hands and my elbows on my knees and I just started crying. And I, I'm not a crier. I do not cry. I have not cried in I don't know how long before that night, uh, but there I was. And I can't explain what had happened, but there was this change. And I was on the crying around maybe half a minute before I said to myself, Brian, you just have to get back up and go to work. You have to go to work. I mean, in times of crisis, we do not stop. Other patients depend on us, our team depends on us. So you have to go back to work, which is what I did for that night and the next day and the day after that, just going to work and ignoring everything else until Monday. And when I first said, I'm not gonna to go to this conference, press conference, I, I texted my wife and said, you know, there's going to be a press conference today. You may wanna watch it, but I'm not going to go. Within seconds, my wife called me. And if you talk to her, this is where our stories diverge a little. She will say that she is a supportive spouse, which she definitely is. I will say at times she can be a directive spouse in the most loving way, of course. And she said, Brian, you have to go to that press conference. You do not have a choice. This is bigger than you. You've been checked out for the past few days, but the narrative is that black men are evil, black men are killers, and people need to actually at least see you on camera so that they know that there was a black doctor that night trying to save these police officers. You don't have to speak, just go there to be seen. I understand what she was trying to say. Uh, I still didn't want to go there, but I did. And as you can see, I'm sitting there with, with my colleagues. I could not even fake that I did not want to be there. I was literally counting the minutes till this was over and I could leave. But as this press conference continued, they didn't just, things just didn't sit right with me about how things were progressing because I felt that there was a much bigger issue that was not being addressed. And this is a lesson for all of us when we think that our voices don't matter, that our opinions don't matter. But as it progressed, I thought to myself, okay, this has to be said. If I don't say it, it will never be said. But I can think of a list of reasons why I should not speak up. Most of them were based in fear I was worried about backlash from people I know. I was worried about backlash from strangers. I was worried about possibly getting fired for saying these things. Most of what I thought of was, was negative repercussions, but the reality is for me, this, this could not be avoided. So at some point I decided to speak. And here's what I said. I want to say first and foremost, I stand with the Dallas Police Department. I stand with law enforcement all over this country. This experience has been very personal for me and a turning point in my life. There was the added dynamic of officers being shot. We routinely care for multiple gunshot victims. But the preceding days of more black men dying at the hands of police officers affected me. I think the reasons are obvious. I fit that demographic of individuals, but I abhor what has been done to these officers and I grieve with their families. I understand the anger and the frustration and distrust of law enforcement, but they are not the problem. The problem is the lack of open discussions about the impact of race relations in this country. And I think about it every day 
that I was unable to save those cops when they came here that night. It weighs on my mind constantly. This killing, it has to stop. Black men dying and being forgotten, people retaliating against the people that are sworn to defend us. We have to come together and end all this. So I was not prepared to speak that day, but clearly a lot of this stuff was percolating within my conscious and subconscious for a long time. And I wasn't prepared to speak, and I certainly was not prepared for the response to what happened. That day, all of the folks you saw at the table spoke. This press conference went on for more than half an hour, but that two minutes is what has seemed to have resonated with many people. And to this day, I still get reminded about, you know, I saw your press conference. And I have to remind people, it wasn't my press conference. Many of us spoke, which is a lesson for all of us. You think that what you have to say may not matter. You think that what you say will be ignored, but you will never know that until you speak up. I want to After this event, I mean, the whole country was sh showing love to Dallas. Dallas came together. Uh, Obama's, the Bushes came out. Uh, uh, the Bidens were there. This is the, this was a picture from the memorial for the police officers that occurred a couple of days after that press conference. I'm up in the third level of this, watching this occur. And I just think about this. What would it be like if we could come together more often than not? And not just after a tragedy that brings us together to celebrate the commonality of what it means to be uh, an American, a human being. And after the, the memorial, when everybody left the, the, the opera house, I went back in and I sat down in the front row by myself and I was just staring at these pictures of these officers. And I was there for a long time, just thinking about why this occurred, how can we prevent it in the future? Three of these officers were ones that we cared for at our hospital. And then I just realized, you know, Brian, what you are doing is not working. There's something more that needs to be done. But of course, in true fashion, it took me a while to come to the decision to make a change. But a year later, I resigned from the university and in two years after that, uh, packed up and moved to Chicago, to Chicago, specifically to work at the new trauma center on the South Side. And I came here because this opportunity to work to eliminate gun violence, but also to work on these larger issues when it comes to working toward healthcare justice. I began to think about things that I previously did not think about. And one of them is how we spend, I don't even spend, how we invest money in this country. If 11% of the population is employed in healthcare, 17% of the GDP is spent on healthcare. 25% of all federal spending is on healthcare. So healthcare is an important part of society. If we could transform healthcare, what would that mean for the larger narrative about transforming America? And one of that is just looking at these green boxes here, is recognizing that of the trillions of dollars we spend on healthcare, 90% of it is spent on access, which we know only accounts for about 6% of healthcare outcomes. The rest have to do with socioeconomic factors that have nothing to do with access. And I am all, I'm in the 90% too. And I think about that, okay, if we invested money differently, what could, what could that mean? 
So I'm at this point where I'm thinking, okay, I got this level of expertise, I have this experience, um, but am I investing my time to have the maximum impact? Which takes me back to these initial graphics we saw. So when you look at these, what do you see? You see dots, colors, statistics. When I look at this, I see the manifestation, I see how racial injustice manifests as healthcare injustice. I see how black Chicagoans are suffering the most from gun violence, suffering from COVID infections, and now suffering from lack of, of vaccination uptake. And it's not just about healthcare, and it's not just about Chicago. I'm in Chicago talking about this, but this is an issue that transcends geography, transcends ideology, and transcends our economic status. We can all have a part in eliminating this sort of injustice. There cannot be healthcare justice without racial justice. And this is a famous quote by Martin Luther King, who talked about this back in the 60s. He actually said this quote when he was in Chicago doing some of his work for social justice. And we hear this quote a lot during this time of year around his birthday. But back then, when he said this, he was excoriated in the media and public opinion. He was actually labeled the most dangerous man in America by the FBI. But he was saying something that was said by W.E.B. Du Bois back in the 19th century and that we're seeing repeated again today in the 21st century. And I think a lot of us see how important racial justice is for transforming society. So that first seminal moment for me was learning about my cousin dying. And yes, it was intimate partner of violence. Her shooter escaped led the police on a multi-state chase before he was cornered and shot and killed. And I think about the number of people's lives that were impacted by that one act. Her children saw her die, the police officers that risked their lives chasing him, me, most states away thinking about this. But also on May 25th, 2020, was when the world saw George Floyd get killed. And there was a point where we could not turn away. It was on video, it lasted minutes, and people that may have been on the sidelines no longer were on the sidelines. They came up and realized, yes, racial justice is an issue. And a broad coalition of voices were speaking out against, against it and also taking action. Which brings us to today, we are at a moment where we can transform our society in the name of justice. And we all have something we can do about that, either on an individual level, a community level, or a systemic level. Just choose what works for you. So I ask you, what are you going to do when it's your press conference moment? Because those moments are happening around us every single day. Are you willing to at least show up and take your rightfully earned seat at the table, just to be seen. And if you're there, are you willing to actually speak up to make sure that your voice can be heard because there is power in testimonials. And if you can't show up and speak up, can you speak up for those that may never have the opportunity to be at the table? Because that's how we achieve justice, to paraphrase Supposedly Ben Franklin said this, but there's been some debate. There's a quote where justice cannot be achieved until those that are unaffected by injustice are as outraged by those who are. So can you speak up for those that are not at the table? But thank you for this extreme honor to speak to you all this evening. Thank you, Andrew Hodgman, for the invitation, Dr. Estime for moderating this session. And I want to wish you all peace and strength and sanity for sure. We're coming around the corner for this pandemic, so I want you all to stay safe. And I'm happy to take any questions at this time. I want to thank you, Dr. Williams, for giving just a phenomenal talk. 
I mean, every every time I hear a version of this, I feel like I want to run through a wall and uh, you know, <laughs> sing it to the mountains. So I mean, phenomenal talk, and it's unbelievable to hear that uh, you know hear that story. So um, please, I want to remind uh, all of our pan or all, our, all of our guests, our participants today, um, to use that Q and A box to to ask any questions um, that you have uh, for Dr. Williams. I'm going to start off with a couple of my own questions, and and you know, a lot of these, a lot of these, I'll I'll be frank, probably won't have a definitive answer, but hopefully it opens up dialogue for, uh, for much needed discussion. So Dr. Williams, you know, my first question is when, you know, when I hear about your experiences, your credentials, what you've done and the exposure that you've had, you know, it, it seems like, you know, you're really ripe for, um, for an advocacy platform, just given the fact that you know, you, you are a trauma surgeon, you feel this, you breathe this, you live this day in and day out. What are, what about those that perhaps don't, don't have those, those credentials, or maybe don't feel like they have those credentials? I know for myself as an anesthesiologist, I definitely didn't feel like I had at one point those, those credentials to, to, to sort of speak out from what I see. So what do you say to those individuals that, that perhaps don't feel like they have any kind of existing platform to speak from? How do they get themselves involved in, in advocacy in speaking out for what they believe in? Well, most importantly, I feel all of us have a story and all of us have power with our voices and, and testimonials. And you're right, you and I have these credentials and that gives us a certain degree of privilege, right? We can go into different arenas and have this discussion. You and I dealing with gun violence, we could probably go down to you know, Inglewood and talk about gun violence. And we can also probably go up to River North and have a, have a discussion about gun violence. Our audiences may be different and how we approach the discussion may be different, but we can still talk about these larger issues in ways that hopefully will resonate with audiences. Now, for those of us that you know, may not have the credentials that, that you just, just mentioned, that doesn't mean we don't have power, right? And we don't have a story to tell. So do not let the lack of degrees and things like that prevent you from speaking up because leaders do not all have titles. Leaders do not all have credentials, but what they do have is mission and purpose. And that's what's always driven me is uh, what sort of purpose am I trying to achieve? What sort of impact I, I can have? Not necessarily chase the titles and, um, and the accolades to achieve that. So it does not matter that you may not have those, but if you have a story and you want to have, have impact, this is a matter of just being willing to speak up. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. Um, so we've got a lot of questions coming in through the Q and A, which, uh, which is great. I'm excited to have, you know, sort of entertain a lot of these things. So, um, you know, Jennifer Nixon points it out, you know, there, there are, there are many of there are many issues at play. So, um, Dr. Williams, can you speak a little bit towards the intersectionality of of race as it relates to medicine, health, and even gender issues, including gender inequalities, and you know a lot a lot of the issues around that? Can you speak to that? So, with, with I think twenty twenty has been one of those years that has taught a lot of a lot of people a lot of things, whether they're in healthcare or not. And one is how systemic racism leads to disparities in health. And when I talk about systemic racism, I'm not saying we have a system full of racists. There's just completely different things. When we're talking about systemic racism, we're talking about structures that have persisted over time that were intended to isolate, particularly Black Americans, from the rest of society. Uh, for example, in Chicago, the Dan Ryan was put where it is specifically to isolate Black Chicagoans from the rest of the city. Uh, if we look at the National Housing uh, Act and redlining, those were intended to isolate Black, uh, Black Americans in certain communities. But what has happened over time is that because of that, that's led to economic divestment, 
which leads to uh, increased uh, violence, income inequality. If you keep going on this rabbit hole, we, we see that the, the systems that were intended to perpetuate racist policies continue to leave Black Americans in, uh, at a disadvantage. So if we address those systems, we can transform society. And I think when we do that, if Black Americans benefit, everyone will benefit. Nobody has to give up something for that to happen. And when it comes to gender, there are similar issues of uh, discrimination and inequality within medicine. But if we go back to, to see how racial justice has progressed, you will see that there has been a concomitant progress within gender equality, with gender identity equality. Uh, it just seems that when blacks, black people are, 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 are benefiting, many other discriminated groups within American society, society are also benefiting. So we're not on different teams. We're all working towards the same goal, which is just to recognize the commonality of the human experience, regardless of our race, ethnicity, gender, and gender identity. We all just want to live happy and fruitful lives and be safe within the communities we live. And that can, that can be achieved. Yeah, I completely hear you. I think a lot of times there's so, there's, there can be sometimes a tendency to say, oh, this is a, this is a black white issue, this is a gender issue. This is, I mean, all of these are issues and they all need to be addressed and they should all be addressed, um, you know, sort of uh, together, you know, in a, in a lot of ways. So I completely hear what you're saying with that. Um, we're getting a lot of questions here and I think it's, um, you know, in, in relation to healthcare disparities and, um, you know, are there other policies out there or, you know, what, what are, what are ways that, that we can address healthcare disparities? Because, I mean, I think that really was, um, my big takeaway from, from everything that I saw in 2020 and even into 21, uh, 2021, the degree and the effect that healthcare disparities have on our population. So what, you know, what's being done locally for this? What's being done at a state level? What's being done federally? What works, what hasn't worked? Can perhaps industry get involved to sort of try to eliminate or at least reduce a lot of the disparities that we're seeing? Uh, what, what's your take on that? Well, this is, this is clearly an issue that will require interdisciplinary uh, action from many different sectors, whether it's healthcare, nonprofits, business, individuals. Uh, part one of that is just being willing and able to name systemic racism as a root cause of the disparities that we are seeing manifest now. This did not happen overnight. It is not the result of COVID. It, this has been laid, laid to bear by COVID, but the conditions and the systems that led to this have been around for a long time. So us being willing to, to, mention, to just name that and say that that is a root cause is an extremely important part. And then that question the person mentioned about policies, and I really think that that is uh, a, a, a tremendous part of e eliminating these disparities because like, like Dr. Esme, you and I, in our day-to-day -day jobs, over the course of a year, we may impact a, a couple hundred patients through our clinical expertise, and we educate just a couple hundred uh, trainees as well. All very important, no doubt, and part of a large part of my job satisfaction. But to impact people on the community level, on the system level, that's where policy comes into place. And our public officials, those who are making public policy, they have the, the power to, to make changes that will impact hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people per year, if it's on the local level versus the uh, federal level. And because of that, uh, one of the reasons I created a course to teach at the Harris School of Public Policy, starting in a few weeks, I'm in the, in the, in the home stretch of finalizing my, my syllabus right now, but I had this thought and said, you know what? I've had all this experience and I've seen all these things and clearly this cannot, gun violence cannot be solved on the South side by a new trauma center. Healthcare disparities cannot be solved by just the healthcare industry. So what, 
how can we get interdisciplinary input and action into this? And I said, well, I don't know the answer to that, but what I can do is maybe go to the School of Public Policy and say, here's what I've seen. Now, all of you smart grad students, can you come up with some solutions that may work in the future? Uh, so that is my input into the interdisciplinary potential for solutions. It involves us stepping outside of our, our little Venn diagram and trying to interact with other folks that are working in the same areas to, to achieve uh, social justice. Public policy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, you know, the more and more that I've looked at these, at these issues and, you know, spent time thinking about it, the more and more I've realized that, you know, a lot of change needs to be made upstream, you know, really going upstream and trying to figure out ways to advocate, um, you know, whether it's our congressmen or senators, um, whether it's trying to propose policies at a local level. Um, I mean, really going going upstream is um, is the way to hopefully make lasting, you know, real lasting changes. And that's um, not also that's not something we in healthcare we're ever really taught to do or encouraged to do, really, right, Dr. Estelle? Absolutely, no, kind of absolutely. Us, but our voices are an important part of informing those that are making decisions. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, from from uh, you know from our perspective in the trauma intensive care unit. At, especially at the University of Chicago, we we sort of see the end of the line of, of a lot of our patients that have lived lives of disparities, of, of injustices, et cetera, from all different types, shapes, and forms. And we see the end result. And we're just trying to in, and take care of that end result is a full-time job and some just in and of itself. So, and, and that's what that's what we are trained to do. Um, but you know, when you do it for when you're doing it for a while, you realize that you know, I, you know that that's exactly what it is. You're treating an end stage process where you're almost too late. I mean, even if you save the person's life and get them out of the intensive care unit, have you really addressed the problem? Have you really fixed the problem? Where you're putting a band aid on a pipe leak? You know, um, and I think that's where really going upstream and, and thinking about these issues in a broader context is is essential. Um, we, we have a lot of questions from, uh, from medical students. They want to know, as a medical student without you know, a formal degree yet, how do they get involved in these platforms? What's their voice? What's their role? I tell you, I'm, I'm most excited by the medical students and the, the, the newer residents that are training nowadays because my experience interacting with them is that they are very socially aware and courageous when it comes to these issues of injustice. They are not afraid to speak out. They're not afraid to organize. They're not afraid to take action. Uh, prime example, the, the photo I showed was the White Coats for Black Lives. Those are medical students. So I think there's plenty of opportunities locally and nationally uh, to, to get involved in these issues of healthcare injustice. I think it, there's no better time than now I mean, 20 years ago when I was in medical school, it never occurred to me that I would get involved in these issues of social justice, even though I was aware of social inequality, because I felt my job was to become a good doctor and serve my community, and that was enough. That was my contribution. But again, as you said, Dr. Estime, we're treating the end, the end stage of the problem. We need to go upstream. That's where advocacy comes into, that becomes important. That's where it becomes public policy becomes very important. And every medical student out there, you already have expertise and respect within the community by virtue of being in medical school. You may think you don't because you're still taking direction from residents and attendings, but you'd be surprised how much your voice will carry as long as you're willing to use it. So just step into the arena, write, uh, organize, take action, get involved. There's plenty of opportunities. I'm very excited to see what's going to happen when they are actually in charge running healthcare systems around this country. It's going to be a very different time when that when that occurs. Yeah, I would say that um, you know from a from medical student level, it's unbelievable the the. Yeah, it didn't, doesn't feel doesn't feel that long ago that I was a med student, but you know, I guess it has been because the curriculum and the questions that are coming out and the way that these medical students are coming out now and, and thinking about questions from uh, really a societal level is is just so far beyond what 
where where me and my classmates were at. And I think going into going into it, it doesn't have to be necessary. It doesn't have to be medical school at all. I mean, there are so many different um, ways to 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 get this done, and so many different routes um, to really be an advocate. Medical school is just one very tiny slice of what can be done. Um, but going in there, thinking about these questions uh, uh, as you enter in, and, and almost letting that be your motivating force, your guiding force, can be the power to um, really get you through those tough times and and to think about these questions with the professional training that you're going to get. Um, what about, well, let me ask you this, because this is actually a question that Imani Owens had uh, as well, too. What about what about even those that maybe aren't in medical school, maybe are even further down, maybe they're perhaps are high school students, perhaps they're, you know, an undergrad, you know, are, are there specific things that they can get involved in to help with issues like gun control and equitable health care? I mean, because it, it is, it does, you know, the, <laughs> these problems are so big, it's hard to think like, hey, I'm just in, I'm an undergrad, how do I, what do, what do I do? So I guess, what specifically can they do, Dr. Williams, to, to do it? Right, so you're right. These seem like just tremendous, insurmountable uh, problems that are that we were unable to solve. And within that, I just see opportunity. Even after this last year, with all the tragedy we've dealt with, with uh, you know deaths and uh, the COVID and COVID deaths, and uh, you know all the sorts of violent deaths that occurred within uh, the country, I see opportunity, right? Because we see what happens when injustice goes unchecked. And we see that there is potential for us to transform society so this does not happen again. So if the, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago, right? That's what we say, you wanna plant a tree? Should have done it 10 years ago. So right now in 2021, it is time for us to plant our social justice tree for the next generation. 20, 25 years from now. And, you know, high school students, far be it for me to tell you to, uh, to, to be in support to your parents because you are, you are minors, but do not underestimate the impact you can have. You just have to do you. You have, you have to be you. And part of that is being curious about the world around you, being willing to step outside of your, your comfort zone, and then finding what it is that works for you if you want to have positive impact in the world. You have to do that consistently with integrity, with an eye towards how am I a positive force? How can I have positive impact? And that can be simply just checking your friends when they're saying things that you know are just not in line with equality and social justice. Student newspaper, starting your own podcast, uh, there are so many avenues now because we have access to uh, share our ideas in ways that you know I didn't have when I was in, uh, in medical school or, or in high school that exists now. So find out what you're passionate about. Do you do with integrity, consistency, and always with an eye towards how can I be a positive influence in the world? Yeah, I completely, I, you know, I think that um, especially in our age or in our, you know, in this in society now, the power of social media, the power of really being your own platform, irregardless of what your backgrounds are, who you are. If you've got passion, if you've got drive, um, and you've got tenacity, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people I've seen become become incredibly, incredibly influential, um, you know, in, in their own space, in their own home, you know, just using social media and just perhaps their ability to write or the ability to communicate with producing YouTube videos, et cetera. I mean, I can't, you know. Um, and this just also, Dr. Estime, we to use a baseball reference. We don't always have to all hit a home run every single time. Right. If we just keep hitting singles, put enough of them together, you'll, you'll score a run. So it's about consistency and staying focused on the end goal. And yeah. anybody can do that. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I'm getting, I am getting some questions. Um, <laughs> Sort of relating to what, uh, what what's next for you, Dr. Williams. I mean, one of these, Dr. John Ellis, who um, you know, so are you considering running for an elected office? I mean, where does all this, you know, where does where does all this work um, eventually go for you? Yeah, I'm I'm in, I'm in this evolutionary stage of I mean of just life 
in, in general. And uh, I feel like at the University of Chicago, I'm in a perfect place at the perfect time for all of these things I've discussed that have been weighing on my mind or coming together at a point where I could put that into practice every single day. So uh, as a trauma surgeon, I, I get to uh, deal with gun violence victims. As an academic, I get to teach every day, which is, that's a huge part of my job satisfaction is teaching. I'm, I'm an educator at heart. So teaching is a very important part of what I do. Um, but also knowing that you know, as, as, a, as a division and as a department, you know, the surgeons are kind of focusing on what diversity, equity, inclusion means, but also what advocacy and social justice means for the South Side community of, of Chicago. And the university is going through changes now as well, reckoning with its past and how they're going to move into the future. So it's a great time to be here at the university to, to bring all these things together. As for what happens next, I'm, I'm still kind of feeling my way through that. I don't know all the opportunities that are out there, uh, but some things I've, I've written a book, hoping to get that out next year. Uh, I'm working on a, to develop a new center here at the University of Chicago, which the working title is Racial Justice in Medicine. I'm working on that. Uh, business plan is in progress, doing the mission, vision, goals. Um, so I've learned that that is a multi-year project. I had my idea, I was like, let's, I'm ready to go, let's get it started. And then of course, I ran up against the, Dr. Williams, slow down. And it, you know, now it's been a test of my patience <laughs> and tenacity to know that there's, there's a process that'll take a few years to get that up and going. But that's the thing I want to, to, uh, to get going is this center that is at the tripartite mission of research, and education, but also advocacy. That would be interdisciplinary, you know, not just healthcare, but uh, legal, uh, social sciences, uh, business, to like, how do we work together on these, these, these large problems and contribute to transforming uh, society? And then uh, there's one other thing that I'm, I can't talk about just yet, but when that occurs, that'll be the next, that'll be the next stage that will help me learn the things I need to make that center of success in my role here at the university uh, much broader, I think much more impactful for uh, the city of Chicago. Yeah, well, I'm going to be definitely uh, eagerly, eagerly listening in and waiting. And I'm not trying to be coy. I'm not trying to be coy. I've just, just been told you cannot talk about this just yet. But when it does, okay. I'll call you up, Dr. Stanley. I'll let you know. <laughs> My phone is on. My phone is on. Um, and, you know, uh, Dr. Brian Williams, for those of you that don't know, is very, very active on social media as well, too. He's got a, um, a Twitter you know, account that has lots and lots of followers. So you can keep up, to date, um, keep up to date with what he's doing and sort of where he's going on that. Um, in addition to his website as well, too. Are there other ways that um, people can follow you if they're if they're interested in sort of looking at your trajectory and and, and seeing where you go? Uh, probably the one stop shopping is I have a website, brianwilliamsmd.com. I spell Brian with an, with an I. And on there it has my social media tags for LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, I'm most active on Twitter. Like pretty much I have an addiction. I just clearly admit that whatever algorithms they use to program people, it's worked on me and it's just paying off hugely for them. Um, so just go to my website and uh, sign up for my newsletter as well. I kind of keep people up to date, up to date frequently uh, through the newsletter. Uh, so that's the easiest way to, to keep track of me. And I think I shared my email in the, uh, in the slides as well. Feel free to email me anytime. A lot of individuals have also asked about, you know, how your experience has been in Chicago um, particularly uh, in comparison to, to, to Dallas and, you know, perhaps how the platform has changed, perhaps some of the differences that you've seen between the cities, maybe the responses to uh, some of the violence that you've seen. What, what sort of, what are some of the differences that you've seen between the two cities and, um, you know, what, what's, what's, yeah, what's your take on that? Well, here at the University of Chicago, let's talk about this from a clinical standpoint, the, the volume and the acuity of gun violence uh, is much higher. And it's comparable to what I experienced 10, 11 years ago when I was a fellow in Atlanta. Uh, but clearly the new trauma center, there was a need for it on the south side. Uh, we have a penetrating rate of about 40%. 
So four out of 10 people that come in are shot or stabbed. Most of them are actually are shot. And, uh, you know, it's not something to celebrate. That to show that there was a need, but that there is much more to be done to eliminate that sort of violence within the South Side. And just being a, just the trauma center is not, not enough for that. So I, I see that there's an opportunity that can evolve a lot of the university because uh, we're fortunate here at the University of Chicago that there's all these other schools here that are working on huge problems. I mean, we have Nobel laureates that are walking the halls of the university. So how lucky are we to be able to be in this environment where uh, if I want to talk to you know, a world-class attorney about something, I, I could do an email and possibly actually have lunch with that person with a mask on, socially distanced, of course. Uh, those are the opportunities that exist here uh, in Chicago that really excite me is the, the potential for interdisciplinary collaboration to solve big problems that uh, impact Chicago, but also to be, be a model for the uh, rest of the country. And which is part of the motivation for my course at the Harris School and for my you know, working to meet people from other domains within the university. But it is so huge. I don't even know where to go all the time. Uh, so I have to take a lot of shot in the dark quite frequently. So that's one of the, the huge differences I see here is that the level of violence is, is the volume is high, the acuity is high, it is, it is constant. There is no rest, as you know, Dr. Estimate in the OR, it's seemingly nonstop. And, but it just shows that with that, there is opportunity and I think an obligation for us to not just treat patients that are injured, but what is it can we do to go upstream and eliminate the causes of those injuries? And that's where we require uh, interdisciplinary collaboration, folks from many different domains to work on these singular problems. And by doing that, I think the entire city of Chicago will, will benefit if you think about it. Less violence, less policing, less incarceration, uh, businesses may, may um, reinvest in this, these communities. There's so much that can happen if we eliminate the gun violence. I have grand ambitions, Dr. Estimate, grand ambitions. Oh, I know this, I know this, I know this well. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think we're going to, uh, we're going to, this has been an excellent, excellent discussion. Um, we, uh, we really only have time for one more question. So I'm going to try to encapsulate all the unanswered questions that we've had. Thank you. Thanks to all our participants for having just unbelievable questions. And I apologize for not being able to, uh, to get to more of them. I think one question that encapsulates a lot of the questions, um, are sort of, you know, how do we have these, these really difficult discussions? I mean, you would mention, particularly even in that CNN uh, clip from Dallas, where we need to have more open, honest, and frank conversations surrounding these really, really challenging issues as it relates to social injustice, as it relates to ra racial injustice, as it relates to healthcare disparities, how to fix them, who to do this. I mean, how do we have these discussions, particularly in, in our climate now where we sort of all can pretty easily exist in our own little social and thought bubbles? I mean, how do we have, how do we have these discussions? How do we reach across the table and engage in dialogue with people that perhaps um, believe very little of, of, of what we believe? you know, um, or what, what you believe? How do we engage that? What's the best way to, to, to do that? So the, these difficult conversations, are, they are necessary and it's, it's a start, but understand that there are a lot of people that are past the point of discussion and are, are ready for action. Um, but if we're gonna start with this discussion that requires people to be curious about the others, the unknowns, and being willing to step into that uncomfortable space to have safe, constructive dialogue about these issues and being willing to allow people to share their biases and their fears uh, with, with, with the points of reaching some uh, moment of commonality. And to have these conversations sometimes requires you know, advanced preparation to set up a time, set up ground rules, for these to be had so that they're constructive and don't devolve into 
a shouting match. So there must be intentionality, a curiosity, and a willingness to be uncomfortable. Now, there are many that are past talk and want, want action. Uh, but we have to be, meet people where they are sometimes. And, you know, I want to create a world where social justice, is, that is just, that's just part of the air that we breathe, that uh, justice is achieved for everyone. But to achieve that sort of world, we have to recognize where we are now. And not everyone is there. Not everyone's even willing to, to talk about it. So we have to work within the parameters and the constraints that we have now but still keep pushing the needle, never give up. The, the movement never stopped. It's just had peaks and valleys. You know, we are now at another inflection point where more people are getting involved and more people are willing to speak up and take action. So these difficult conversations are necessary. We have to be curious, be willing to be uncomfortable, but also understand that talk is not enough. We have to move from there to action. I totally agree. Um, we are, that is, that is probably it for, uh, for time. I mean, I could do this for another hour, but unfortunately we've all got families to go to and, you know, we've got a time limit here. So, um, any, any closing remarks, anything that you want to, you want to say before we, um, transition back to, uh, to Andrea for, for her closing remarks. I just want to reiterate my thanks for the privilege of speaking tonight. Again, thank Andrea Hodgman for the invitation. And just to tell everyone to never under, underestimate the power of your voice, no matter what you may think of yourself or your importance, you all have a story. You all can make a difference. We all can have impact as long as we're willing to own our individual stories and power and be willing to share that with others. That's how you recognize the commonality of the human experience. And that's how we make change. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank you, Dr. Williams, for sharing your knowledge, your insight, and for um, you know a very, very entertaining question or very, very, very entertaining discussion, uh, rather. Um, and I will uh, transition now to, to Andrea. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. This is really powerful, and um, I'm inspired to speak up during my press conference moment. Um, and I, I just want to let you know, I also appreciate a good baseball analogy. So thank you for that too. And thank you, Dr. Estime for facilitating a, a very thoughtful conversation. And I'd also like to thank all of you for attending today's virtual Harper lecture.